you for coming. It's a pleasure to be because it is almost becoming a regular habit, but uh, it's in such a delightful place. I couldn't resist. Yes. It's, not just me. it's not exotic enough for you, I know. But, but. Let me start with what I think is kind of the ironic nature of the moment as far as democracy is concerned. Namely that <clears throat> at the same moment that something on the order of 80 or more countries have entered into what they hoped would be a transition from different forms of autocracy toward democracy. Most of those countries, when they did it, did it with the explicit intention of imitating the previously, well, what I call real existing, previously established democracy. The irony is that in almost exactly the same moment, the pre-existing democracies entered into a crisis themselves. So you were trying to imitate the institutions which themselves were entering into a very serious crisis. So I'm going to talk about that crisis. But the most important thing about it is how amazingly general it is. That is, certain characteristics you will find everywhere. In old democracies, new democracies, European, American, whatever, there's a certain set of characteristics that clearly, I think, indicate a crisis. Not a crisis of any particular democracy, but of what I call real existing, in other words, liberal, constitutional, capitalist, uh, and especially representative, which I'll come back to in a moment. So. <clears throat> It's not an episodic crisis. There's a second characteristic about this crisis that I would emphasize. I'm sure that some of you in this room are familiar with the name and perhaps the work of Robert Dahl, professor at Yale University, and in many ways the most important democratic theorist of this generation. Dahl observes that one of the peculiarities of democracy is that it has changed enormously while keeping the same name. So democracy starts out and then it goes through a series, he calls them revolutions. They're strange revolutions in the sense that they do not usually occur violently. And many of the people involved don't think of themselves as revolutionaries, but nevertheless they transform the nature of democracy. And so that's the history of democracy. It, it remains the same by being different. That's the famous de la Pedusa bit. <laughs> that's, for those of you, incidentally, this, this is a, how many of you know the de la Pedusa? Did anybody, it's, it's a, it, the book is called Il Gato Pardo. <laughs> I must know this is, this is an absolute model of our time. So Garibaldi has landed in Palermo and the count is telling his young son what to do. And he says, Massa. Hmm? Telling, yeah, right. uh, telling him what to do. And he says, Son, if things are going to remain the same, things will have, if things are going to remain the same, they will have to change. So we will have to change in order for things to remain the same. So that's the history of democracy. It keeps changing in order to remain the same. And those central principles are, at least in my view, three. One is citizenship, the notion of political equality of a certain set of rights and that everybody equally has, and then participation, and then finally accountability. So those are the three you go back, and they're already there in the classic Greek thinking about democracy. And they keep, now they change, of course, greatly in terms of what you actually do. The other thing about these revolutions of Dole is that in the past, these revolutions occurred one after the other, with usually some considerable space in between. So he talks about three. The Thai's revolution, nobody until the 1700s believed that the democracy was an appropriate form of government for any political unit which was larger than a Greek city-state or a Swiss canton or whatever, it was simply not on the agenda until the late 1700s. Then it becomes 
larger. <laughs> it becomes possible to, and then it becomes possible also to have a democracy when you have a government with a much wider range of activity. And it turns out also to be possible to have a government in which a much greater proportion of the citizens are citizens, or the inhabitants, let's call them. Because originally, the conception of citizenship was restricted to a very, very small group. In case of Greece, it's estimated at 8%. I can't remember the original British, but not much more. In true liberal Britain, I get with two. Two percent. Yeah. So you had the long land, you had to pay so many times. Okay. So we now the difference what we're looking at now is the simultaneity of these revolutions. So they're piled up on top of each other, so to speak. And that is what makes it much more difficult. A to imagine what kind of a future democracy would have, because it's not going to be a simple resolution one after another, but a complex interaction between different sources of revolution or transformation. And uh, therefore, uh, it, uh, it, it makes political strategies extremely difficult to imagine. And at least the, I just finished an article trying to imagine what a post-liberal democracy would look like. And I'll send that to Ferry. I don't know if I want to probably send it to you already. Sorry, did I send it to you already? No, 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 no. I just finished it. I just finished it. But anyway, it's it. Now, let's start with was it little thing here? Okay. The entire talk is is this it? Yeah. Is in this design. I call these the sources of the crisis. I don't want to talk much about what's inside the little box there, the crises, because I think we would we know what they are. There's you know declining voter turnout. Nobody joins political parties anymore. People are more likely to shift their vote from one election to another. There's a whole series of it's much more difficult to form governments than it used to be. <coughs> I live in Italy and I'm in the middle of, <laughs> again, a country without a government, at least a functioning, electorally supported government. Anyway, so we may come back to that. Now, my basic idea is that there are two sources, I don't call them causes, sources of crisis. Some of them, and they're the ones there on the left, are endogenous to democracy itself. Anybody who studies democracy recognizes that democracy has a tendency toward entropy, toward losing energy, and especially, of course, oligarchy, to go back to the famous, like, okay, the iron law of oligarchy. So here we have things that have been taking place more or less simultaneously inside democracy independent, as we'll see in a minute, of social structure, international relations, various types, etc. So we have organized interests. The effective citizens of modern democracies are not individuals, they're organizations. And those organizations insert their own interests independently of those of their members. They speak in the name of their members, but as organizations, they have their own standard operating procedures, their own conceptions of interest which they try to uh, inculcate or to teach to their members. Then there is the one which I think is responsible for a good deal of what I will come to in a minute, namely the professionalization of the role of politicians. Democratic theory presumed from the very beginning, and in fact so much so that in the Greek case, of course, many of the uh, leadership positions were chosen by lot. And you couldn't repeat. <laughs> they, you could not. You would no longer be eligible after you've been chosen. So somebody, even though it was a very small percentage of the population who were citizens, was, it's estimated that about one third of the ancient Greeks, at some time during their life, and they had to be male, of course, uh, were in government, so to speak, Cho chosen at random. Right? Well, you can't professionalize a political class if you're going to choose them randomly. So to speak. So as soon as you move to elections, of course, then elements of repetition and the so-called incumbency advantage 
enters and that changes. But the professionalization, the fact that most p p politicians uh, go into politics and intend to make it their life, their, their life profession. They don't, in the say, have something to go back to because at some point, who often these days in student movements, it is at the beginning, they and dedicate their lives to politics as a profession. Convergence, this is it's a misspelling here, convergence of party programs, particularly traditional parties, it's one of the reasons, of course, that traditional parties have declined so dramatically is that in the conception or perception of voters, traditional political parties do not offer significantly different choices. And it's that, of course, which then opens up the space for new parties and the fringe of the previous existing. Fourth one is one that actually Bob Dole also talks about. I call it here the spread of guardian institutions. Increasingly, democracies have recognized that there are a series of political issues which cannot be left to the uncertainty of political competition. And they are assigned to professional technocracies of various kinds. The most obvious and important at the present moment, of course, are central banks. But there are many other regulatory and other institutions. The result is that there's a whole range of issues now in contemporary democracies which never are discussed openly and certainly not competed over in parliament or in elections, but assigned to these guardian institutions that are presumably above politics and presumably act in the name of some kind of professional expertise. Whether they do or not is another matter, <laughs> but, but that's the presumption <coughs> that they assign the responsibility for very important policy, policy issues. To, and then, of course, just to make it worse, we come to number five, which is a pretty distinctively European, but not exclusively a phenomenon, namely that we all now live in a multi-level system of governance. And of course, all the more so in the, if you happen to be a member of the EU, in which and the embarrassing thing, of course, is that many of those guardian institutions now are no longer national. The most famous one, of course, historically, is the IMF, and later the World Bank for less so, but also WTO. There's a whole series of universal organizations which set rules. And then, of course, within the European Union, I think it's now there are 36 regulatory agencies at the European level. And I don't even think that includes the European Central Bank, which has a special statute of its own, so to speak. So this multi-layered governance so that the result is that people are, find it very difficult to uh, understand uh, who's making the decisions, who's responsible, who do you hold accountable when you're in a, and I don't need to tell you, but I think Hungary is a major case of this, is the, the tendency for national politicians to blame supranational uh, institutions for things that they would have done or could have done or should have done anyway, but nevertheless it's convenient to blame everything on Brussels or wherever and then absolve yourself from responsibility for policies which you would have taken anyway, but you're very happy to not have the responsibility for. So those are endogenous to democracy itself and especially to, let's call it, systems of democracy on a regional or other basis. The conclusion I arrive at is that the sum total of these changes is what is behind what I think the, the most important endogenous condition, which is mistrust of politicians. And that is amazingly universal. So if you ask these survey questions of Eurobarometre, or Latino Barometre, there's, a, there's an Asian one now, and I don't think there's a single country where the uh, trust in politicians has increased. Now, there are a few countries, Denmark, okay, which is the one that stands out, I might add, in Europe, in which trust in politicians has at least remained more or less the same, whereas 
everywhere else. <laughs> Even Sweden next door, <laughs> but not, of course, as much as it has declined. In, in Italy, it never was very high anyway, but you can't go much further down <laughs> than in the case of Italy. But uh, so distrust of politicians strikes me as the cumulative product of these changes that are endogenous to democracy. On the other side, we then have the fact that democracy is always inserted or embedded in um, this social, economic, cultural context. Right? This is Polanyi's observation, among others, so I'll, I'll call this Polanyi, but I'm exaggerating, of course. Anyway, so over here, we have a series of changes uh, that have actually transformed the raw material, if you see what I mean, the nature of inhabitants or citizens within these democracies. The first is this dramatic transformation in the nature of work itself. Right? And here, of course, it has a lot to do with the shift from an industrial to a service economy. And it also has to do with the fact that it interacts with these others, of course, that the, the units of production, if I can call it that, uh, within contemporary uh, capitalist societies are smaller and smaller. So instead of up to a certain point, the units got larger and larger for this so-called Fordist or you know, standardized production, etc. And that still exists in some parts of the world. But in Europe and most of the real existing democracies then, people are working in smaller and smaller and more individualized work sites, so to speak. Second is finance capital. That has radically changed the nature of social cleavages. Right? So that nowadays we have a system of it where the center of accumulation of contemporary capitalism is in finance and what's more now, should I say it? Disturbing is that much of this finance is purely speculative. It's not finance of fixed investments in larger and larger firms or production sites itself, but it simply circulates, rotates, so to speak, and follows some kind of pattern of risk and risk taking and profit that generated by that. So the lines of cleavage, the classic one, particularly the one around which all democracies were organized, the so-called left-right cleavage, which was produced by industrial capitalism. Under finance capitalism, it's much more fragmented, the cleavages. And to make it even worse, every one of us is cross-pressured by finance, because part of us depends on the stock market, on our pensions and various other things. And the other part, of course, is being exploited by these very same institutions. So we are, in some sense, uh, internally divided as well as externally divided into more and more uh, specific spheres of interest. Then globalization, of course, production and consumption. Then, of course, the one that I that is most interesting and puzzling, I have a, just a, enlarged a section on this, is the change in the technology of politics information, ICT is the usual, you know, information communications technology, the web or whatever you want to call it. And here, it's very, very interesting, because when the, when the web first started exploding, there was a very substantial literature, including some by a few friends of mine, I might add, of enthusiasm that this new technology was actually going to make us more democratic. And more democratic in two ways. One was that it radically diminished the so-called circulation or organizational costs. So you could get hold of anybody, right? And virtually no. So you could find people, and presumably then by doing that first virtually, then people would become actually active. So it was supposed to lead to a more participatory form of the second was even more far-fetched, but this was uh, very much influenced by Jürgen Habermas and his students. <laughs> Namely, 
that people would use this new technology to deliberate, to go online and to find people and to listen to the arguments of other people and somehow or another become more better informed and presumably more inclined to reach agreement uh, across the usual or previous lines of cleavage. We now know that it's exactly the opposite. We do not go online to listen to dissenting voices. You go online to find people who agree with you, and, and it reinforces those, that sense of agreement, especially in polarizing. And of course, it's very questionable whether, I mean, the data is a little bit confused, or, or let's say incon unconvincing, uh, at the extent to which people who are active online also then become actually active, so to speak, whether or not somehow that leads you to an appetite for. Uh, this is a footnote. I, I, I talked for a while in, in Cairo after the revolution, and I met some of the students who were involved in the Tahir Square. Uh, there. And uh, <laughs> this is, of course, this is really dramatic because they got rid of Mubarak. It was a real, you know, it, it was an amazing movement. And without the internet, it wouldn't have happened. They all agree with this that they had to have that form of contact partly because the government couldn't <laughs> control it so that they could get together, get in touch with each other without having to go through some kind of more public media. But most importantly was the complete failure of this incredible, extensive, virtual group that kept meeting in larger and larger numbers in the square and in other squares, but especially in the Tahiti Square. And then afterwards, they couldn't do anything. And then they began to discover that while they could agree on going to the square, they were actually very different people for all other purposes. They did not form a single coherent group. And so the group that took over power was not the group that had anything to do with Tahrir Square. The Muslim Brotherhood was not active in the, in the mobilization against Mubarak. But they were organized. They were real. <laughs> they had a structure which eventually was converted into a winning candidacy, which didn't last very long. That's another matter. But so here, this is the big question mark, so to speak. So, can, what's the relationship between this new technology of virtual communications and the eventual conversion of that into something like a a permanent, but at least reasonably organized, consistent form of collective action that usually requires some kind of face-to-face -face with actual means. And then finally, there's this diffusion process. And that, of course, is related to both globalization and to this new technology, so that experiences in one country very quickly become learned or about or heard about and then eventually internalized in other countries. So there is this contagion effect. And I think you're seeing this very clearly in East Central Europe among the Visegrad bunch. Right? It strikes me as a, as a case where there's a good deal of diffusion going on. So something that works well electorally or otherwise in country X then becomes a factor in country Y which is certainly less and much less the case in the past. So, summarizing this exogenous sources, I, come, I, I discovered or rediscovered this concept of Emil Jokai, Anomi. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this, but Jokai, in the 1890s, I think the first was 19, published in 1906, um, came to the conclusion that periods of rapid economic and social transformation then had a tendency to destroy the bond, bonds and relationships and especially identities of primary groups, whether they were village or whether they were religious, religious or whatever the, the group. And, and, and of course, much of this involved movement from the countryside to the city. Right? And that those people then who found their shall we say, established uh, identities, the kind of identities which you're born into, so to speak, were undermined then by this transformation. The problem was that Durkheim did not recognize that industrial capitalism created new 
I think. And that's where we got the left-right, where we got the basic structure of competition in party systems in Europe. So, and only in that sense then, as, as predicted by Durkheim, didn't happen, or it happened to certain groups on the margin, right? But basically then, new forms of solidarity emerged based on social class and various other professional uh, categories. Durkheim was recognized that. So, but the, my argument is, is that these characteristics here do not create new solidarity. They, on the contrary, divide us into increasingly individualized life experiences, and you lose this sense of common identity, with which comes a no me, meaning norms. That you have some kind of sense of organization and what you should and should not do with different kinds of situations, etc. So that's my summary. It's just on the one side then mistrust of politicians and on the other side the raw material. It's much more difficult to be a politician. It's impossible to represent individuals. You can only represent categories of individuals. That was Doc Veen's main observation about the United States is that what made democracy in America work were that Americans in these, at that time, of course, pre-industrial villages, etc., had a strong sense, and religion he emphasizes time and time and time again as a primary organizational feature around which American politics uh, developed in the 1830s. Huh? So what, does it, what are those identities now? They lead, as I say, on the one hand. So the raw material, how can you represent anomic individuals? It's extremely difficult because A, you can't reach them. You don't even know what they want because they're highly individualized. And in the past, you could, uh, you could communicate with religious, uh, class, other kinds of leader, professionals, etc., and they would speak for. So all representation dependent on the pre-political formation of some kind of collective identity. And that pre-political process is not what it used to be. So that's where we get this joint crisis of distrust on one side and, and on the other. Alone, they would not necessarily produce that much of a crisis. Most anomic people simply become inactive. They complain a lot, <laughs> but they their very anomie makes it difficult for them to act collectively. But if you combine that with the mistrust of politicians and the, shows a provision of information of very dubious <laughs> nature, then you get kind of episodic. And for me, that's the basis of populism. That's why populism is so different than the usual kinds of political party organized parties and ideologically structured parties. <coughs> so, sources. Those are the two, and it's the coincidence of these two that makes the present crisis, I think, much more serious. And uh, as I've argued in another article, to me, it's a crisis not of democracy. It's a crisis of a particular type of democracy, and that's liberal democracy, and specifically, it's a crisis of the mechanism of representation. So that was the big invention of liberals in the early part of the 1800s. Parties emerged. I think it was the Irish party. <laughs> it was the first one in the British Parliament anyway. But anyway, the parties emerged as a relatively late feature in that particular period. And now we find lots of new parties, but emerging on the, the fringes and appealing then to these anomic people. We have a, I'll just insert something because I, uh, I, I, I got involved in this, we just came back from Berlin when we had a big conference on populism and what is populism and why is it and blah, blah, blah. And it turns out that I, I've had to deal with it much longer than most people because I was a Latin Americanist before I became interested in the rest of the world. So I have studied places like Argentina and Brazil and Mexico and Chile and whatnot. And we were interested in populism. And so there, is a, there was a theory 
behind it's a social theory of populism. And it fits nicely with the uh, anomie thesis. The, the code word in the Latin American literature was um, incongruent status, uh, status incongruence. In other words, people who felt they should have had certain kinds of recognition and didn't receive it. In the case of Latin America, populism came from upwardly mobile. People who, particularly people who had moved from the countryside to the city and found political systems which were dominated by landowners or by large whatever. So you had this oligarchy uh, arrangement where you had democracy, Argentina, for example, Chile, and even Brazil for a while. And then these became mobilized against an established oligarchy. In our cases, it's exactly the opposite. It's the downward people. It's the people who had a status and certain expectations and which find those that those expectations frustrating, particularly, of course, in terms of their children. That is to say, the perception that the children, even themselves in their own work life, but especially children, will have less and less opportunities and be more and more looked down upon so to speak. So those are, I think, the core populist movements of the right. So in Latin America, you've got populism of the left, and there's still some of it <coughs> there, but mainly here, you're getting downwardly mobile, status incongruent, downwards, that are, the, I think, the core, sociological core of appeal for populism. OK. Then we have, as always, the fact that you have sources of political change, transformation, but then you have this famous notion of agency. That is, somebody has to understand this and transform it into some kind of collective behavior that could influence the outcome. Right? So that's the process of agency, of transforming them, these rather, shall we say, remote sources of change into some actual behavior. And here, I have to say that I'm, uh, maybe it's just because I live in Florence, but I'm a very strong uh, proponent of uh, Machiavelli, you know, thinking on this subject. And Machiavelli had these two concepts. The first was fortuna. So much of what happens in politics is simply due to things that you could not have predicted. Right? And, but they make a huge difference. And then, Virtu, meaning the capacity of politicians to understand, interpret what's going on, and to act in some ways that is appropriate to that understanding, and transmitting that also, obviously, to followers. To, right? That's the, 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 I should say, the core political virtue is this capacity to understand the, the nature of the power inherent in different situations. So here's a list of Fortuna. The most obvious is the collapse of the Soviet Union, and obviously made a radical difference in it. Because until the collapse of the Soviet Union, see, nothing was better for liberal democracy than Soviet people's democracy, so to speak, because liberal democracy was so clearly a more, so we say, livable situation. And therefore, much of the legitimation of liberal democracy was not on its own terms, but simply because it was better than a conceivable alternative. Once that alternative disappeared, people began asking much more critically, you know, <laughs> are we really treated like citizens? Do we really have equal opportunities to influence? And then you discover that, of course, you don't. And therefore, the, the basis of legitimacy is weakened by the absence of a plausible enemy alternative or whatever. And that's important also because uh, if you look at the history of uh, changes in uh, democracy uh, and its institutions and practices, you will discover that what's extremely important is the threat of revolution. So people in power are more inclined to be willing to reform or change their rules if they can conceive of a revolution which would make them dramatically worse off. And of course, the most important associate 
revolution is war. So war is what changed most of the world. Because of war, you had that. Of course, you had this wonderful coincidence in the case of the Soviet Union in 1917, where they went together, so to speak. And then you have the famous three to five years, depending on which country you're in, from the end of World War I into the 20s. And it produces fascism in Italy in the first instance. That's the, the core. So absence of a revolutionary thing and peace, protective peace has changed the nation on democracy. Most of the, 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 many of the democratic movements come out of war, and of course they create identities as Frenchmen or whatever it is. Right? You even become Swiss because of war by staying out of a war. <laughs> and that becomes the most important uh, collective feature of, I'm part Swiss, so I say that, <laughs> being Swiss is to have avoided <laughs> what happened to the, to the neighbor. And then, of course, you have the French used to refer to this as les, les 30 glorieuses, the 30 years after World War II, in which there was consistent economic growth. Right? That's over. So we now have inconsistent, if we have growth at all, it's inconsistent and it's much lower than it used to be. So that fortunate coincidence that presided over those famous 30 years is over. Right? I think that dramatically changes the Fortuna aspect. Then there's the question of where to. Uh, and I tried to find some. Uh, the most obvious is the increase in education. <coughs> People are supposed to know more than they used to. However, it does make them more critical. The more you know, the more likely you are to be critical about what you discover by, by increased educational levels. And that's survey research pretty much. Is so that then there is this diffusion of virtuous experiences. So some countries do it well. In my particular case, when I was studying transitions from autocracy to democracy, the case which was by far the most uh, important in terms of diffusion was Spain. So the so-called pacted democracy outcome in Spain was observed. I think even by Hungarians. I think done. But didn't Lazzi tell me this that? That somebody sent a delegation to Spain to study pacting in the Spanish context. And it seems to have influenced also the pacting here in Hungary as well as in Bulgaria. I can't remember where else. So, so again, there's an example. Bruce, Bruce Lassi, it's very famous. It's a pactum yeah. study, yeah. But Lassi says that the, 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 there was some group of Hungarians that team went to Spain to try to find yeah. out how the Spanish language do to do this, and, and uh, so there's an example. Then, of course, there's an entire industry now of democracy promotion of NGOs and of government agencies, the most important of which <laughs> is the EU, of course, for you here in Hungary. I mean, I, 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 I was once in a polemic with a Sovietologist, American Sovietologist, and they considered, they had a, they had a, a, a wonderful thing. Since communism was different, post-communism will be different. That was the motto of the Sovietologists, though they, they, they could not imagine a democratic outcome from post-communism. Because communism was different, therefore the differences. And then you had, you know, I thought, ridiculous arguments that somehow people in these communist countries were somehow so indoctrinated with Marxist-Leninism that they could never you know, behave like these liberals. I had been traveling a little bit in Poland and here, and I didn't discover many Marxist <laughs> liberals or Leninists. With but anyway, that was so clearly uh, this was, I thought. But anyway, the point was, however, is, oh, yeah. And then after some years afterwards, I met What's her name? Valerie Bunce. Does anyone oh, know sure. Valerie? Very yes. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, I met Valerie well, the very, very polemic argument right. saying that, that you know all this stuff that these people are writing about transitions in Southern Europe and Latin America is completely irrelevant for for Eastern for both communist countries. And so I we were at a conference together and I quietly asked her on the side. I didn't want to embarrass her publicly. I said, 
you stupid. <laughs> and she said, and, and the answer was perfect. She said, we forgot about the European Union. <laughs> so the idea was, they were right, except they forgot about the European Union. And, and uh, you know, if it hadn't been for the European Union, then you would have gotten all kinds of other completely different outcomes. But we forgot about the European Union, and since joining the European Union became as overriding an objective as being democratic and capitalist, <laughs> and in a package, so to speak, and with this famous conditionality that the EU imposed on these countries, then the outcome was different. So we forgot about the EU. Right. So that's what I mean about transnational organizations, some private, some public, etc. And then finally, there's the question of whether political science contributes to better outcomes. Or I, I'll leave that to. Although I must say it is interesting in this particular instance, particularly I think the democratization literature, uh, while it was external to the process, it became internal to the process. People began using the same vocabulary that we <laughs> were developing, so to speak inside the process itself. So those, particularly this business of active transitions became, you know, a, a, an important theme and it was picked up all over the place. So, so that's the, the basic. Well, thank you.